The Shirangama Sutra, Fascicle 10 of 10. Chapter 8 Warning to Practicers The Fifty False States Caused by the Five Aggregates. The Ten States Affected by the Fourth Aggregate of Discrimination, or Sanskara. Ananda, in his cultivation of Samadhi, when the third aggregate of conception ends, the practicer will be free from the usual delusive thinking and will achieve the still and bright state of mind which is like the clear sky and is always the same whether waking or sleeping and devoid of the shadows of coarse sense data. To him, the mountains, rivers, great earth and universe are reflections in a bright mirror, appearing and vanishing without leaving a trace behind. Thus, his mind only reflects externals without being affected by them. This is the one essence, or alaya, in which the fourth aggregate now manifests. The practicer will perceive all living beings of the twelve types of birth in the ten directions, and though he does not know the true cause of their existence, to him they are all in the same state of life. This functioning of mind, or sanskara, is like a twinkling mirage that disturbs the clear horizon and is the chief cause of the illusion of the sense organs and data. This is the fourth aggregate which conditions the practicer's meditation. If this sparkling disturbance returns to its serene source, or alaya, like ripples that settle to become calm and clear water, the aggregate sanskara will come to an end and the practicer will leap above and beyond the kalpa of turbid being, the main cause of which is the undetected subtlety of his wrong thinking. 1. Ananda, you should know that when the practicer, as a result of pointed concentration after the third aggregate has vanished, acquires correct knowledge in his practice of shamatha, his mind is settled and clear and can no more be troubled by the ten classes of demons. Only now can he look exhaustively into the origin of living beings. In his discovery of the subtle disturbance, which is not easily detectable, if he begins to differentiate, he will fall into error because of the following two heterodox conceptions of the non-existence of cause. 1. He finds no anterior cause of existence in his investigation. Why? Because he has wiped out the mechanism of life and can now, by means of the eight hundred merits of his organ of sight, look into the eighty thousand kalpas in which all living beings transmigrate from place to place and beyond which he can see nothing. He then concludes that all living beings exist of themselves without any cause during these eighty thousand eons, and because of this differentiation he will miss the Buddha's universal knowledge, thereby falling into heresy which will screen his Bodhi nature and two, he finds no posterior cause of existence in his investigation. Why? Because he has seen the root of life and concludes that, as always, men beget men and birds birds, that crows are black and storks white, that men and devas are upright and animals slanting, that their white color does not come from washing, nor their black color from dyes and that all this has been and will be so throughout these eighty thousand eons. Since he never saw Bodhi before, how can he realize it now? He will now conclude that all things come from no cause, so he will miss the Buddha's universal knowledge and will fall into heresy which will screen his Bodhi nature. The above pertain to the first state of heterodox discrimination, or sanskara, which postulates the non-existence of cause. 2. Ananda, in his cultivation of samadhi as a result of pointed concentration, the practicer's mind is now settled and can no more be troubled by demons. He can look exhaustively into the origin of all living beings, and in his discovery of the subtle disturbance which continues endlessly, if he begins to differentiate, he will fall into error because of the following four heterodox conceptions of universal permanence. 1. By looking exhaustively into the mind and its object, he finds that both are causeless. And since his meditative study enables him to know that in 20,000 eons all living beings 
are subject to the endless round of births and deaths without being annihilated, he gives rise to the wrong concept of the permanence of mind and its object. 2. By looking exhaustively into the four elements, he finds that they exist permanently, and since his meditative study enables him to know that in 40,000 eons all living beings preserve their forms which are not destroyed in spite of their births and deaths. He gives rise to the wrong concept of the permanence of the four elements. 3. By looking exhaustively into the six organs and the seventh and eighth consciousnesses, he finds that the origin of mind, intellect, and consciousness is permanent. Thus, his meditative study enables him to know that in 80,000 kalpas all living beings always preserve this origin, and that it always remains, thereby giving rise to the concept of the permanence of the Eighth Consciousness. 4. As the practicer has wiped out the third aggregate completely, he wrongly thinks that life has ceased to flow, and that, since his thinking mind, or Sangya, has ended, that which now remains, that is, Sanskara, is permanent thus giving rise to the concept of the permanence of the fourth aggregate. Because of his wrong conception of true permanence, he misses the Buddha's universal knowledge and falls into heresy which screens his Bodhi nature. The above pertains to the second state of heterodox discrimination, or sanskara, which postulates wrong permanence. 3. Further, in his cultivation of samadhi, which, as a result of his pointed concentration of mind, can no more be troubled by demons. If he looks exhaustively into the origin of living beings and begins to differentiate as he contemplates the continuous subtle disturbance in this clear state, he will fall into error because of the following four perverse views of the duality of permanence and impermanence. 1. The practicer looks into the profound bright mind which pervades everywhere and regards it as his spiritual ego. He finds that his ego, which is bright and unchanging, embraces all the ten directions and that all living beings are born and die by themselves in his mind, thereby concluding that it is permanent and all those subject to birth and death are impermanent. 2. The practicer instead of looking into his own mind, contemplates countries which are countless as the Ganges sands, and thereby regards as impermanent those regions which are annihilated in the Kalpa of destruction, and as permanent those unaffected by it. 3. The practicer looks into his mind, which, to him, is subtle and mysterious, like molecules which penetrate everywhere, and whose nature is unchanged, and can subject his body to birth and death simultaneously in every flash of thought. He regards that which does not decay as his permanent ego, and that which is subject to birth and death and flows from his ego as impermanent. And for the practicer, who knows that after the third aggregate has vanished, the fourth one flows continuously, will regard the latter as permanent, and the first three aggregates, which have already ended, as impermanent. By so differentiating between permanence and impermanence, he falls into heresy, which screens his Bodhi nature. The above pertain to the third state of heterodox discrimination, or sanskara which postulates the duality of permanence and impermanence. 4. Further, in his cultivation of samadhi, which, as a result of pointed concentration of mind, can no more be troubled by demons. If the practicer looks exhaustively into the origin of living beings and begins to differentiate as he contemplates the continuous disturbance in this clear state, he will fall into error because of the following four dual views of the finite and infinite. 1. He looks into the origin of life, which flows endlessly, and concludes that the past and the future, which he does not see, are finite and that his present mind, which does not stop, is infinite. 2. He looks into 80,000 kalpas and sees living beings in this long period of time, 
But when looking into the time prior even to that, he sees and hears nothing. He then concludes that the region where he sees and hears nothing is infinite, and the one where there are living beings is finite. 3. The practicer finds that his knowledge reaches everywhere, and concludes that since all living beings appear therein, that is, in his knowing mind, his nature is infinite. As their knowledge, that is, their minds, do not appear in his, he reasons that their minds are finite, as well as their nature. And for, as the practicer looks exhaustively into the fourth aggregate and finds that it ends in emptiness, he reasons that its end is annihilation, and its manifestation is creation, and so infers that each living being partly exists and partly does not and so concludes that all things in the world are half finite and half infinite. By so discriminating between the finite and the infinite, he falls into heresy, which screens his Bodhi nature. The above pertain to the fourth state of heterodox discrimination, or sanskara, which postulates the duality of the finite and the infinite. 5. Further, in his cultivation of samadhi, which, as a result of his pointed concentration of mind, can no more be troubled by demons. If the practicer looks exhaustively into the origin of living beings and begins to differentiate between views when contemplating the continuous subtle disturbance in this clear state, he will fall into error because of the following four confused views about the undying heaven. 1. As he investigates the origin of transformation, he may call changing that which varies, unchanging that which continues, born that which is visible, annihilated that which is no more seen, increasing that which preserves its nature in the process of transformation, decreasing that whose nature is interrupted in the changing process, existing that which is created, and non-existent that which disappears. This is the result of his differentiation of the eight states seen as he contemplates the manifestations of the fourth aggregate. If seekers of the truth call on him for instruction, he will declare, I now both live and die, both exist and do not, both increase and decrease, thus talking wildly to mislead them. 2. As the practicer looks exhaustively into his mind, he finds that each thought ceases to exist in a flash and concludes that they are non-existent. If people ask for instruction, his answer consists of the one word, nothing, beyond which he says nothing else. 3. As the practicer looks exhaustively into his mind, he sees the rise of his thoughts and concludes that they exist. If people ask for instruction, his answer consists of the one word, something, beyond which he says nothing else. And for the practicer sees both existence and non-existence and finds that such states are so complicated that they confuse him. If people ask for instruction, he will say, the existing comprises the non-existent, but the non-existent does not comprise the existing in such a perfunctory manner as to prevent exhaustive inquiries. By so discriminating, he causes confusion, and so falls into heresy, which screens his Bodhi nature. The above pertain to the fifth state of heterodox discrimination, or sanskara, which postulates confused views about the undying. 6. Further, in his cultivation of samadhi, which, as a result of his pointed concentration of mind, can no more be troubled by demons. If the practicer looks exhaustively into the origin of living beings and begins to differentiate as he contemplates the endless flow of the fourth aggregate, he will fall into error because of his wrong view of the continued existence of form after death arising from his upset mind. So he clings firmly to his body and believes that form is ego. He sees that his mind embraces all countries everywhere and believes that form is within ego. He sees that form is now restored to follow his ego 
and believes that ego exists apart from form. And he sees that his ego continues to exist in the flow of sanskara and believes that it is within form. These are the four kinds of discrimination arising from the belief that form continues to exist after death. Thus, there are sixteen kinds of such discrimination due to wrong contemplation of the first four aggregates, or Rupa, Vedana, Sangya, and Sanskara. From then on, the practicer discriminates between fundamental troubles, or Klesha, and fundamental Bodhi as existing side by side without contradicting each other. For this wrong view that form continues after death, he will fall into heresy that screens his Bodhi nature. The above pertain to the sixth state of heterodox discrimination, or Sanskara, which postulates the wrong view that form exists after death. 7. Further, in his cultivation of Samadhi, which, as a result of his pointed concentration of mind, can no more be troubled by demons. If the practicer looks into the origin of living beings and begins to differentiate as he contemplates the fourth aggregate, or sanskara, which will vanish in the same way the first three, namely rupa, vedana, and sangya, did before, he will fall into error because of his wrong view of the non-existence of form after death arising from his upset mind. He saw that form was causeless, when Rupa vanished, that his mind was free from bondage when Sungya ended, and that all links were broken when Vedna stopped. He now concludes that once the aggregates are no more, life deprived of Vedna and Sungya is like grass and plants. Even Rupa does not exist in life. How can there be form after death? So his investigation reveals the non-existence of form after death, with the ensuing eightfold absence of form. Hence, his belief that nirvana has neither cause nor effect, and that all things are void, have only empty names, and are fundamentally subject to annihilation. For this wrong view of annihilation after death, he falls into heresy that screens his Bodhi nature. This is the seventh state of heterodox discrimination, or sanskara, which postulates the wrong view of annihilation, or ucceda darshana. Eight. Further, in his cultivation of samadhi, which, as a result of his pointed concentration of mind, can no more be troubled by demons. If the practicer looks into the origin of living beings and begins to differentiate as he contemplates the fourth aggregate, which now manifests, whereas Rupa, Vedna, and Sungya have vanished, he will fall into error because of the wrong dual view of existence and non-existence, which is self-contradictory and which implies the negation of both after death. Thus, Rupa, Vedna, and Sungya, previously seen to exist, now do not. If Sanskara, which now manifests, is likewise not to exist, it is, in fact, not non-existent. If these four aggregates are likewise looked into, the conclusion is the eightfold negative view of form in life and after death. Thus, each of them, when investigated, can be said to be neither existing nor non-existent after death. Further, since the fourth aggregate is always changing, he reasons that both its existence and non-existence are invalid, for it is neither real nor unreal in life, so he infers that nothing can be said of it in the dark and obscure condition after death. For holding the above views, he will fall into heresy that screens his Bodhi nature. They pertain to the eighth state of heterodox discrimination, or sanskara, which postulates the invalidity of both the existence and non-existence of the five aggregates after death. 9. Further, in his cultivation of samadhi, which, as a result of his pointed concentration of mind, can no more be troubled by demons. If the practicer looks into the origin of living beings to differentiate, as he contemplates the fourth aggregate, which is subject to annihilation after its rise and fall in every flash of thought, he will fall into error because of his wrong conception of either one of the seven states where body, desire, suffering, joy, and indifference are destroyed.
and where nothing exists after their annihilation which is final. For this wrong view of annihilation after death, he will fall into heresy which screens his Bodhi nature. This is the ninth state of heterodox discrimination which arises from the upset mind and which postulates the annihilation of the five aggregates after the present life. 10. Further, in his cultivation of samadhi, which, as a result of his pointed concentration of mind, can no more be troubled by demons. If the practicer looks into the origin of living beings and begins to differentiate as he contemplates the fourth aggregate which will recur after its annihilation after death, he will fall into error because of his misconception of the five false conditions of nirvana. In his contemplation of the condition of perfect clearness which now manifests, he is tempted to transmute into nirvana either a the heaven of desire because of his delight in that condition b the first dhyana heaven because it is free from trouble and anxiety c the second dhyana heaven because it is free from suffering d the third dhyana heaven because it is full of joy or e the fourth dhyana heaven which is free from both suffering and joy and is beyond birth and death in sansara thus he will mistake sansaric heavens for the fundamental Wu Wei state and cling to ether one of these five states as an ultimate abode, offering peace and security. Because of this differentiation, he will fall into heresy, which will screen his Bodhi nature. This is the tenth state of heterodox discrimination, or sanskara, which postulates five conditions of nirvana arising from the five aggregates. Ananda these ten kinds of wild interpretation of dhyana come from the intermingling of the fourth aggregate of discrimination with meditative mind. Deluded and wayward practicers who do not know their own capabilities cannot distinguish these states when they manifest and wrongly declare that they have attained the holy rank. By so doing, they will break the rule against lying and so fall into the unintermittent hells. After my nirvana, in the Dharma ending age, you should proclaim this teaching, so that living beings will awaken to it, that the demons of their minds will not lead them to self-inflicted calamities, and that all practicers can be on their guard and wipe out heterodox views. You should teach them how to discipline their bodies and minds, so that they awaken to reality and avoid straying from the supreme path and to refrain from wishful thinking and from mistaking some little progress for complete realization. You should act as their guide to supreme enlightenment. The ten states affected by the fifth aggregate of consciousness, or Vijnana. Ananda, in the cultivation of Samadhi, when the fourth aggregate of discrimination, or Sanskara, comes to an end, the subtle disturbance in the state of clearness, that is the functioning of sensoric mind, which is the mechanism of birth and death, suddenly explodes and exposes an outlook completely different from that of the profound karma of Pudgla, that is, all beings subject to transmigration. This is the moment when nirvana is about to dawn, like the cock-crow that heralds the first light of the day in the east, when the six senses are void and still, and no more wander outside. Within and without there is only a profound brightness reaching the root of life of all beings of the twelve forms of birth in the ten directions of space, wherein there is nothing that can be further penetrated. This contemplation of the essence of basic clinging, that is, the fifth aggregate of consciousness, releases the practicer from all attraction by old habits and new karma, and immunizes him from further transmigration in sansara, for he has realized the identity of mind with its self-created externals everywhere. As the nature of consciousness now manifests clearly, he will discover its hidden depth. This is the fifth aggregate of consciousness, which conditions the practicer's meditation. As the practicer is immune against external attractions and realizes the identity of mind and objects, the separateness arising from the six different sense organs ceases, 
and the mind functions uniformly with seeing and hearing in regard to a single function which is pure and clean. In this state all the worlds in the ten directions, together with his body and mind, are clear and transparent like crystal, both within and without. This is the end of the aggregate of consciousness, which enables the practicer to leap over and beyond the kalpa of turbid life, the main cause of which is the first seeming shadow of his wrong thinking. 1. Ananda, you should know that as the practicer looks exhaustively into the fourth aggregate, or sanskara, it will return to its source, that is, the fifth aggregate, consciousness. Though he wipes out birth and death, he does not yet achieve the pure and profound state of nirvana. He can now unify the different functions of the sense organs, and so is aware that all beings are created by consciousness. Thus he can enter the source of perfection, but if, on his return to it, he wrongly sets it up as the cause of true permanence and regards this as correct, he will fall into error and will become an adherent of the Kapala doctrine, which postulates primordial darkness, thereby screening his Bodhi nature and missing the Buddha knowledge. This is the first state of the aggregate of consciousness which sets up the mind thus realized as ultimate attainment so straying far from complete enlightenment and standing opposite to nirvana, thus sowing the seed of heresy. 2. Ananda, as the practicer looks exhaustively into sanskara, which now becomes void, he will wipe out birth and death, but will not yet achieve nirvana. If he regards consciousness as his substance and insists that he is right in thinking that all living beings of the twelve types of birth in boundless space spring from his body, he will err because of his wrong conception of a subjective creator and will become an adherent of Mahishra, who appears in a body which has no limit. It will screen his Bodhi nature and will cause him to miss the Buddha knowledge. This is the second state of the aggregate of consciousness, which sets up the mind creator as ultimate attainment, thus straying far from complete enlightenment and standing opposite to nirvana, thereby sowing the seed of great pride in an omnipresent divine ego. 3. As the practicer looks exhaustively into sanskara, which now becomes void, he will wipe out birth and death, but will not yet achieve nirvana. If he clings to consciousness as his refuge, he will interpret that his body and mind, as well as the whole of space, spring from that refuge, thereby wrongly inferring that this source is true reality, free from birth and death. Because of his misinterpretation of the jnana, or consciousness as permanent, he will understand neither the uncreate nor the created birth and death. For his delight in this deluded state, he will fall into error because he mistakes impermanence for permanence and will thus become an adherent of Ishwara Deva, the divine ego who creates all things, thereby screening his Bodhi nature and missing the Buddha knowledge. This is the third state of the aggregate of consciousness which sets up the causal mind as ultimate attainment, thus straying far from complete enlightenment and standing opposite to nirvana and so sowing the seed of perfection's opposite. 4. As the practicer looks exhaustively into sanskara, which becomes void, he will wipe out birth and death, but will not yet achieve nirvana. If he clings to his knowledge of his all-embracing consciousness, or alaya, and so sets up his own interpretation that all grass and plants are sentient and do not differ from men, and that after death men will become grass and plants, if he delights in such misconception, he will fall into error because of wrong knowing and will become an adherent of the doctrine of Vasishta and Shani, thus screening his Bodhi nature and missing the Buddha knowledge. This is the fourth state of the aggregate of consciousness, which sets up the knowing mind as ultimate attainment, thus straying far from complete enlightenment and standing opposite to nirvana, thereby sowing the seed of inverted knowing. 5. As the practicer looks exhaustively into sanskara, which now ends, he wipes out birth and death, but does not yet achieve nirvana. 
If he awakens to the uniformity of the six sense organs, as he contemplates the original transformation of the four elements, he may be tempted to worship the brightness of fire, the purity of water, the freedom of wind, and the creativeness of earth. He will regard them as fundamental causes of creation and as permanent reality, thereby falling into error because of his wrong view of creation. He will follow the teaching of Kashyapa and other Brahmins, and will, in his quest of immortality, offer his body and mind to serve and worship fire and water, thereby screening his Bodhi nature and missing the Buddha knowledge. This is the fifth state of the aggregate of consciousness, which postulates the worship of the elements, thus throwing away the mind to pursue its objects, and wrongly seeking the causes of fruition. He will thus stray far from complete enlightenment, and will stand opposite to nirvana, thereby sowing the seed of inverted transformation. 6. As the practicer looks exhaustively into sanskara, which now ends, he wipes out birth and death, but does not yet achieve nirvana. In this state of bright and empty consciousness, he may be tempted to believe that voidness destroys all things, and will cling to annihilation as his last refuge. He will fall into error, because he clings to nothingness, and so will think that devas without thought are void, thereby screening his Bodhi nature and missing the Buddha knowledge. This is the sixth state of the aggregate of consciousness, which is completely void and mindless, leading to empty fruition. The practicer will stray far from complete enlightenment and will stand opposite to nirvana, thereby sowing the seed of annihilation. 7. As the practicer looks exhaustively into sanskara, which now ends, he wipes out birth and death, but does not yet achieve nirvana. In this continued state of consciousness, he may be tempted by its seeming permanence to try and make his own body deathless and free it from mortality. Such misconception will cause him to fall into error because of his wrong desire, and to follow the teaching of Asita, Rishi, who postulates longevity, thereby screening his Bodhi nature and missing the Buddha knowledge. This is the seventh state of the aggregate of consciousness, which clings to long life and sets up the false cause of preservation in the search for permanent fruition. The practicer will thus stray far from complete enlightenment and will stand opposite to nirvana, thereby sowing the seed of false prolongation of life. 8. As the practicer looks exhaustively into sanskara, which now ends, he wipes out birth and death, but does not yet realize nirvana. In his contemplation of the aggregate of consciousness from which springs life, he may be apprehensive that its end will cause the total annihilation of the worldly. He will, by means of the power of transformation of Alaya, sit in a lotus palace and exhibit the seven treasures and beautiful girls to give rein to his mind. He will thus fall into error because of his indulgence in falsehood and will follow the heavenly demon, thereby screening his Bodhi nature and missing the Buddha knowledge. This is the eighth state of the aggregate of consciousness, which gives rise to the cause of worldly fruition. The practicer will thus stray far from complete enlightenment by standing opposite to nirvana thereby sowing the seed of heavenly demons. 9. Further, as the practicer looks exhaustively into sanskara, which now ends, he wipes out birth and death, but does not yet achieve nirvana. As he contemplates his bright consciousness, if he begins to differentiate between its fine and coarse characteristics, thus implying the duality of reality and falsehood in his search for the truth, he will stray from the pure and clean path. He will look into suffering, the cutting of its cause, its destruction, and the way thereto, and will stop at its annihilation without striving to advance further. By so doing, he will follow those whose minds are fixed on the Shravaka stage, those devas of the four dhyana heavens, and those who refuse to hear further about the Dharma, and so develop self-conceit, 
thereby screening his Bodhi nature and missing the Buddha knowledge. This is the ninth state of the aggregate of consciousness, which unites with its essence for nirvanic fruition. The practicer will thus stray far from complete enlightenment by standing opposite to nirvana, thereby sowing the seed of obstructive voidness. 10. Further, as the practicer looks exhaustively into sanskara, which now ends, he is free from birth and death, but does not yet achieve nirvana. As he contemplates the bright and pure essence of consciousness, if he looks deeper into its depth, he may regard the latter as nirvana, and will not strive to advance further. He will be one of those whose minds are set on Pratyeka Buddhahood, and who live apart from others to seek self-enlightenment, thereby screening his Bodhi nature and missing the Buddha knowledge. This is the tenth state of the aggregate of consciousness, which is the union of mind with pure awareness, culminating in clear fruition. The practicer will thus stray far from complete enlightenment by standing opposite to nirvana, thereby sowing the seed of incomplete enlightenment. Ananda, these are the ten states of dhyana leading to wild speculations because the practicer relies on delusion and regards inadequate achievement as full realization. They are due to the intermingling of the fifth aggregate of consciousness with meditative mind. Deluded and wayward people who do not know their own capabilities rest their minds infatuated by former habits on these states which now manifest and which they regard as their ultimate abodes. They will wrongly declare that they have realized Supreme Bodhi and will thus break the rule against lying thereby forming the evil karma of heretics and evil demons which will send them down to the unintermittent hells. As to Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas, whose minds are fixed, they will not make further progress. After my nirvana in the Dharma-ending age, you should all proclaim this teaching so that living beings will awaken to it that the demons of their false perception cannot cause them self-inflicted calamities, and that all practicers can be on their guard and wipe out heterodox views. You should teach them how to discipline their bodies and minds so that they achieve the Buddha knowledge by not going the wrong way from the start of their practice. This Dharma door was followed in past eons, countless as the Ganges sands, by Tathagatas numberless as dust, who thereby opened their minds and won the supreme Tao. If the aggregate of consciousness comes to an end, all your sense organs will intermingle for uniform functioning and you will enter the indestructible state of dry wisdom in which your enlightened essence of mind will manifest, like pure crystal with the precious moon within. You will then leap over the ten stages of Bodhisattva faith the ten stages each of a bodhisattva's wisdom, activities and dedication, the four stages of intensified efforts, the ten indestructible bodhisattva positions, or dashabhumi, and the state of universal enlightenment to enter the Tathagata's majestic ocean of wonderful enlightenment, thus perfecting bodhi to return to where nothing can be won. The above are very fine states of Mara discerned by past Buddhas while abiding in the condition of Vipassana when they practiced Shamatha. If you know beforehand these Mara states, you will be able to rub off the dust of your mind and will avoid wrong views. The demons of the five aggregates will vanish. The heavenly demons will be crushed. The powerful ghosts and spirits will take fright and run away. The spirits of the rivers and the hills will not come to trouble you until you achieve Bodhi. You will thus begin your practice from inferior states of mind and then progress toward great Nirvana with a mind free from delusion and perplexity. In the time of the Dharma's ending, some beings who like to practice samadhi may not have sufficient intelligence to practice meditation in stillness correctly or to explain the Dharma correctly. You should be concerned lest they fall under the influence of the kind of wrong views that I have been describing. 
devote yourselves to teaching these beings how to hold in their minds the Dharani mantra spoken at the crown of the Buddha's head. If they cannot learn to recite it from memory, teach them to write it out and to place it in their meditation halls or else to wear it close to their bodies. Then no demon will be able to disturb them. You should hold in the greatest reverence all the teachings of the thus come ones of the ten directions. These are my final instructions. The Falsehood of the Five Aggregates After hearing the Buddha's instruction, Ananda rose from his seat and prostrated himself with his head at his feet. Since he had received the teaching which he could now remember well, he said, As the Buddha has said, the five kinds of falsehood arising from the five aggregates are due to the thinking mind, but we have not heard your explanation in detail. Further, should the five aggregates be wiped out simultaneously or separately one after another? What are their boundaries? Will you be compassionate enough to teach us so that everyone here can cleanse his mind eye and be the future guiding eye for living beings in the Dharma ending age? The Buddha said, Ananda, pure reality is profound enlightenment and basic enlightenment is perfect and pure, containing neither birth and death, nor any impurities, nor even voidness, all of which spring from false thinking. From the profound, enlightened, true essence of basic enlightenment arises the illusion of a material universe in the same way that Yagidatta deceived himself into believing in the image of his head. Fundamentally, falsehood has no cause, but false thinking sets it up and deluded people further mistake it for being the self as such. Even voidness is but an illusion. How much more so are cause and the self as such, which are the product of discrimination arising in the false mind of living beings? Ananda, if you know where falsehood arises, you can speak of cause. But if fundamentally there is no falsehood, how can you speak of cause? Still less can you speak of the self as such. Therefore, the Tathagata reveals to you that the basic cause of the five aggregates is false thinking. Falseness of the first aggregate of form, or rupa. Your body owes its existence first to your parents' thought of giving birth. But had you not thought of being born, there would have been no chance for your incarnation in their thought. As I said earlier, when you think of vinegar, your mouth waters, and when you think of scaling a high cliff, you feel distress in the soles of your feet. But there is neither vinegar nor cliff, and if your body is not of the same illusory nature as falsehood, how can water come to your mouth when you think of vinegar? Therefore, you should know that your physical body, or rupakaya, is the first state of congealation of your false thinking. Falseness of the second aggregate, of receptiveness, or Vedana. We have spoken of the thought of scaling a cliff which can cause your body to feel distress. This is the aggregate of receptiveness affecting your physical body, which is thus moved by favorable or adverse feelings. This is the second state of empty reflection of your false thinking. Falseness of the third aggregate of conception, or Sangya. Your thought can make your body move, but if both are not akin, how can body obey thought's order to act? Therefore, when mind stirs, body obeys, and both act in perfect unison. When you are awake, your thinking mind works, but when you sleep, dreams take the place of thoughts. Therefore, you should know that your thoughts stir your false feelings. This is the third state of pervasiveness of your false thinking. Falseness of the fourth aggregate of discrimination, or sanskara. Transformation never stops and changes imperceptibly every instant, as shown by the growth of hair and nails and the loss of vitality in old age as revealed by the wrinkles on one's face. This change occurs day and night, but we do not notice it. Ananda, if this is not you, why does your body change? On the other hand, if it is you, why do you not notice the change? 
Therefore, you should know that every discrimination does not stop in a flash of thought. This is the fourth state of concealment of your false thinking. Falseness of the fifth aggregate of consciousness, or Vijnana. If your pure, bright, profound, and subtle consciousness is permanent, why is it conditioned by, and does not go beyond your body seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing? If it is the real, it should not allow itself to be affected by your false habits. Very long ago, you saw unusual things, but you then forgot all about them. Why do you remember them so vividly when you now see them again? This shows that the contamination of your clear and still consciousness continues instant after instant in unbroken continuity. How can you ascertain this? Ananda, you should know that this still consciousness is not reality and is like a river which flows swiftly but seems to be still. If you do not see it flow, this does not mean that it stops. If consciousness is not the source of false thinking, how can it be influenced by wrong habits? If you fail to wipe out separateness and achieve the uniform functioning of all your six sense organs, your false thinking cannot be brought to an end. Therefore, behind your seeing, hearing, feeling, and knowing, there is chain of subtle worldly habits, and within your still consciousness there is something which seems not to, but does exist and which is the fifth subtle state of your false thinking. Ananda, all the five aggregates are created by this fivefold false thinking. As to their boundaries about which you wish to know, form and voidness are the boundaries of the aggregate of Rupa, receptiveness and non-receptiveness of Vedana, remembrance and forgetfulness of Sunya, rise and fall of Sanskara, and the return of consciousness to and its union with its substance are those of Vijnana. The five aggregates arise by piling themselves upon one another. They originate from consciousness mind and should be eliminated beginning with form or matter. In principle, they all vanish the moment one is instantaneously awakened, but in practice they are wiped out gradually due to the force of habit. I have shown you how to untie the six knots in a cloth, and all this should have been clear to you. Why do you still ask me about it? You should awaken to the source of false thinking, and open your mind, and then teach practicers in the Dharma ending age, so that they know its falsehood and reject it, become aware of the existence of Nirvana, and so stop hankering after the three worlds. Ananda, if a man fills space in the ten directions with the seven treasures and then offers them to Buddhas uncountable as dust, with his mind set on serving them faultlessly, what do you think of his merits from such a good cause? Ananda replied, Space is boundless, and the treasures that fill it cannot be counted. Once a man only offered seven coins to seven Buddhas, and his merit led to his rebirth as a heavenly ruler of the world. How much more so is the unlimited merit derived from offering treasures that fill Buddha lands in boundless space? The Buddha said, Ananda, the words of Buddhas are not deceitful. If another man, after committing the four and ten sins, or Parajikas, and after falling into the Avicii hells, can, in a flash, think of teaching this Dharma door to living beings in the Dharma ending age, his evil sins will vanish, and his hells of suffering will change into happy places, for his merit surpasses that of the giver of treasures. Because the latter's cannot be even a hundredth, a thousandth, a hundred thousandth of the former's. In fact, no comparison can be made between the two. Ananda, if someone reads and practices this sutra, the whole eon will pass long before his merits can be enumerated in full. He who follows and practices my teaching will be free from all the obstructions of Mara and will realize Bodhi. After the Buddha had expounded this sutra, all the monks, nuns, male and female devotees, devas, men, bodhisattvas, shravakas, Pratyeka Buddhas, Rishis, and newly initiated ghosts and spirits were filled with joy, paid reverence to him, 
and left.